Thank you to Sweetwater for sponsoring this video and supporting my channel. Room correction software is supposed to help your mixes translate better, and Sonarworks has been leading the market with their Sound ID software for a while now, so today I wanted to discuss my experience with it and ultimately answer the question, is this software worth it? Okay, so if you're here for the quick and dirty, then yes, it does have some quirks that we'll talk about a little bit later, but I do believe that Sound ID Reference is a solid investment for any home studio owner. I'll leave a link down below for you to check it out, and if you use my links to purchase, you will also be supporting my channel at no additional cost to you, so there you go. Now, if you're interested in a more in-depth explanation, then let's dive in. So I think a good place to start is by first discussing what room correction software is, what it does and why we need it. So the main issue that these pieces of software are trying to solve is compensating for a room that is not acoustically optimal, as well as for any coloration that is added by studio monitors or headphones. When dealing with audio, you want your listening environment to produce a natural flat frequency response so that any music that you work on in there translates well out in the real world, meaning that what you hear in your studio is what people are going to be hearing in their own audio systems. Now, if you work in a professional studio, then those are purposefully created and professionally treated to be used with audio, so there is less of an issue there, but what about for people like us, the people who work out of spare bedrooms in our homes? The problem for home studio owners like us is that our bedrooms, our rooms, were not built for audio production, so a lot of the times, due to a bunch of different factors, they naturally create boosts and dips in certain frequencies, giving you a false representation of what your music actually sounds like, and thus leading you to make inaccurate mixing decisions. A good example of this is when you mix something in your studio and it sounds great, but then you take it out to your car and realize that it doesn't sound as good. Maybe the vocals are too bright or the bass is too heavy. Well, this is where room correction software comes into play. These types of software use a calibration mic that measures how sound behaves in your specific room, depending on a bunch of different things like its shape, size, speaker placement, and your listening position. Once all that information is taken into account, it shows you on an EQ curve your room's natural frequency response and then creates a correction EQ curve that is basically the opposite of your room in an effort to have it balance out and create a more flat response. The idea, again, is that if you're mixing through a flat frequency response, you are more likely to make better mixing decisions and have your mixes translate on more devices. Now, although I do think that home studio owners are the people who will benefit the most out of this type of software because we have the most to gain, it can also be used with pro studios because as mentioned earlier, your speakers and headphones also impose their own EQ EQ curves, so this software will help by compensating for that. So there are a few sound correction software companies out there, but the one brand that I think has been leading the market for a few years now in this category is Sonarworks with their Sound ID Reference software, which was formerly known as just Reference. When you purchase this software, you have the option of only getting the headphone version, the headphone and speaker version, and then a version that also includes their own measurement microphone. For the headphone version, all you need to do is install it because the software comes loaded with a bunch of headphone presets for you to choose from, so it is the most ready to go version straight out of the box. The headphone and speaker version will require a calibration mic, and you don't have to use theirs, but if you want the easiest no fuss solution, then as mentioned, they do have a bundle that includes all of it. The speaker version is also the one that will require a bit of setup time because you will have to use the mic to measure how your speakers are behaving in your specific room. Speaking of which, let's talk about the calibration process for the speaker version. So the setup process was actually super simple and intuitive, but I do urge you to read the instructions because although it is super simple, you can mess this up if you don't pay attention like me. I won't bore you with the details of the setup, but I do want to give you a word of caution here. If you're using an Apollo interface or any other type of interface that allows you to add effects or inserts outside of your DAW, then make sure to turn them all off. I calibrated my room three times to test the accuracy, and the first two times I took off the preamps and any inserts, but I completely forgot to remove the low cut filter. And yes, I said low cut filter because high pass makes no sense. It wasn't until the third time that I realized it, and this is important because the software kept thinking that I had less low end than what I actually had, so as a response, it kept boosting my low end to compensate. The other thing to make sure is to mute the input that your mic is set to, meaning that you should not be able to hear the mic through your speakers. If you don't do this, the software won't even let you continue, and this is also mentioned in the setup guide, but I was impatient and I didn't read it, so I spent the first 20 minutes thinking that the software wasn't working. 
don't be like me. Now, in the first half of the setup, the software will have you place the mic in several positions to determine your listening spot and the distance between your speakers. Ideally, you should have created an equilateral triangle between your listening spot and your speakers. So if this is not the case for you, you might want to readjust your speakers so you can make this happen. The software was actually really accurate with these measurements. So needless to say, I was really impressed. Once that's done, the second half of the setup is what takes up the bulk of the time because here is where you'll need to use the calibration mic to measure your room by moving between 37 total reference points as your speakers produce sweeping tones to get measurements. Maybe I'm just a nerd, but I found this step absolutely fascinating. In any case, once you do this, you should be done and the software will spit out a graph showing you your results. Okay, so as mentioned earlier, I calibrated my room three times to test the accuracy and it was pretty much spot on with the exception of the last one because the third time, as I mentioned, I actually turned off that low cut filter like you're supposed to. So naturally I ended up using the third profile and let's take a look and see what it's saying. Okay, so check it out. These are the measurements for my specific room. Now, obviously the goal is to be as close to this white line, this flat line as possible, but as you can see, that was not the case for me. So I do have a bit of a roll off here around maybe like 50 Hertz, I'm not quite sure. Um, a couple of other, other dips here and there, a big boost at about maybe 150, a couple dips at like one, two, three, 400 Hertz, and then another boost at about maybe like 1.5 with a couple little tiny ones here and there. So then what this software did is it then added a mirrored EQ curve basically to compensate for what was happening. So with this little dip here around the maybe 50 Hertz or whatever this is, it boosted that as well. Um, and then it just kind of mirrors everything else that's happening. So it basically, after this is done, the simulated after curve would be something like this, which is a lot closer to that flat line. Now, obviously I'm not going to have any of the super low end because I don't have a sub, but that much was expected. Now, the cool thing about Sound ID Reference is that it comes as a computer app that allows you to hear all the audio from your computer through the calibration, but also as a plugin that you can use inside your DAW. Both are great, but what I will say is that if you are planning to use the plugin to make sure to turn it off before you export your mixes, the calibration is only for you to hear in your room. Now, the cool thing if you use Studio One is that you can place this plugin on the listen bus and have the ability to monitor your mixes through the calibration, but not have it print onto your mix. Now, if you're wondering how to bring up the listen bus, simply open up the mixer here, go over to the wrench, and then it should be towards the bottom, enable listen bus right there. Going back to the software though, we can see that aside from calibrating your room, it also gives you a ton of different parameters to mess with. Aside from the flat target calibration, you also get the option to switch to a Dolby Atmos and even a custom target in case you want to modify what the software did. And then of course the newest feature, which is a translation check. The translation check feature basically gives you a bunch of different other EQ curves that emulate other devices in an effort to help you hear what your mixes would sound like in different environments. So for example, here we have a bunch of different EQ curves that aim to replicate different types of cars, in-ear headphones like AirPods, uh, laptops like the MacBook Pros, smartphone speakers, and even other studio speakers like the Mix Cubes or the Yamaha NS10s, which here they refer to as the NS11s. Now, I know a lot of people love this feature, but personally, I'm a bit on the fence. There are a few presets on here that I think sound exactly like what they're trying to replicate, such as the MacBooks and the smartphones, but then you have a few others like the cars and the AirPods that I don't think sound much like what they're supposed to. The AirPods, for example, sound a bit too tinny for me here compared to what it sounds like when I bounce my mix and actually listen through real AirPods. In any case, this is just an additional feature and it doesn't affect the actual calibration which is a software's main focus. Personally though, I like to mix with the software on like you're supposed to, but when I'm nearing the end of the mix, I reference through a bunch of different headphones using their profiles. And if I want to listen through a smartphone or through my AirPods, then I prefer to load up the Audio Movers Listen To plugin to send over my mix to my phone wirelessly and then check it out that way. As for the car, I still prefer to take my mix out to a real car. I find that this not only gives my ears a break, but it gets me out of the studio, which we all need. Now there's a bunch of other little settings here that you can mess around with on your own, but the last thing that I wanna tell you about is this dry wet knob because I think it's actually really, really cool. So if you like what the software was doing calibration wise, but you didn't wanna go all the way, what you can do is go down here to the bottom right and then just kind of use this dry wet knob to create a custom blend between the uncalibrated and calibrated curves. So this is really useful in my opinion. Okay, so I want to end this video with some things to consider and then just my overall thoughts. The first one is that this 
this software will not automatically make your mixes sound better. What I mean by this is that you should not expect to calibrate your room turn on the software and then automatically hear a better mix. That's not how this works. Rather, this software is designed to let you hear what your mix sounds like through a flat curve, whether that is for better or for worse. The other thing is that you will need time to adjust to this new calibration, which is kind of like learning your speakers again. And if you've been mixing in your room for a while, this could either be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how used to your speakers you already are. Last but certainly not least, as good as this software is, it is no replacement for proper acoustic treatment. Regardless of your setup and whether you use this software or not, I would highly encourage you to treat your room as best as you can. But there you have it. Hopefully now you understand a little better what room correction software is, why we need it, and specifically how Sound ID Reference works. As mentioned at the beginning, I do think this is a worthwhile investment for any home studio owner, so I'll make sure to link all the versions down below. But that's it for me. Thank you once again to Sweetwater for sponsoring this video. Links to every version of this software will be linked down below. Thank you for your time, and I'll see you on the next one.